All right, great. Well, thank you for everyone who's joining us and for everyone who'll be listening to this later on. Um, again, thank you for those who joined and become patron supporters since the last time we met. And thank you for everyone for supporting us in what we're doing basically sort of trying to take this message of love and unconditional love around the world. And it's really appreciated that you join with us and helping us to do that. Um, again, I, I, I'm recording it and we'll do some Q&A and stuff later. Um, we've been looking at unconditional love and, you know, I really didn't have any intention of taking so much time over this and doing so many sessions. But the more I've engaged with it, the more I realize unconditional love is essentially the fabric of of everything um, and all my experiences of unconditional love really they've changed my whole belief system um, concerning really who god is um, and the sort of the reach of god's love towards all creation i found that unconditional love is not just for some it's not conditional for some but unconditional for everyone and for everything and that love has no boundaries and no limitations and therefore is available to everybody now, we've sort of looked at various um, issues. Um, we started off with God is love, but, and there are lots of religious buts. Um, most of them, I guess, sat in the pews. Um, but there are also no buts in God's love um, because God's love is totally unconditional. Um, and therefore, whenever we think of God is love, don't think of any conditions attached to it. So I want to continue to explode some more religious myths that really have kept me in bondage for a lot of my Christian life. Um, and But unconditional love has really set me free from those mindsets and belief systems, which really kept me from who I was as a son of God, but also kept me from my true identity in sonship, but also understanding who God really is and my relationship with him as father. So in some previous sessions, we've looked at the truth about how God views sin, forgiveness, repentance, confession, faith, being born again, salvation, in regards to how we view that in terms of unconditional love and how unconditional love changes the way we see all of those different perspectives. Um, and tonight we're going to look at uh, the truth about the Bible in regards to unconditional love. Now, I guess this might be seen as a quite a controversial subject, um, but hopefully I will explain my understanding of how in my journey through understanding God and through understanding the Bible and how that has become sort of deconstructed my understanding of it through my experiences of unconditional love and in some future sessions we're probably going to look at some truth about the old and the new covenants our obligation to the law duty um, and how that is changed when we experience unconditional love and then we'll look at the relationship between unconditional love and the restoration of all things and about God's desire for us to live in health and immortality. If we uh, cannot be separated from the love of God, then not dying is a big factor into that love continuing so we can operate on earth as it is in heaven and outwork the kingdom of God in that way. So when we begin to experience unconditional love, and when I certainly did, it inevitably challenged many of the things that I assumed to be true. Now, I assumed them to be true, some of which because I was told that they were true. I heard someone preach that or teach it. Some of that was I was told the Bible says that it's true. And um, Now, when unconditional love began to challenge some of my understanding, just because I was told the Bible says it's true, didn't make it true and I realized that a lot of things I thought were true weren't really true at all um, and that inevitably caused me to question what is the role of the Bible in my life what is the role of the Bible in our lives and a lot of our understanding of that is come through the conditions uh, and the streams that we may have been uh, programmed by that we may have uh, had experience in and if you come from a Catholic background, then the Bible may have a different role in your life in comparison if you came from an evangelical background. Um, but what is it really? You know, what should the role of the Bible have in our lives? No, I'm not saying don't read your Bible or that God can't speak to us through the Bible because he obviously can. But I believe it's hard to discern God's voice when he does speak to us through the Bible because of the filters of our belief systems that are in place 
which make it sometimes difficult to really hear what God is actually saying rather than what we think he's saying. Now, I don't believe the Bible is God's primary method of communication to us because he wants to communicate to us face to face, heart to heart and speak to us directly. But for some, it's obviously the only way that God can communicate with them because that's their only expectation that God will only speak through the Bible and no other way. Now, for those who come from a more charismatic point of view, you obviously believe in gifts of the spirit and you'll believe in prophecy and, and words of knowledge. And therefore, a relationship with God is more than just the Bible. It's more about then having a relationship of intimacy through the Holy Spirit communicating to us. And the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. And the Holy Spirit will lead us to the truth, Jesus, and Jesus will lead us to the Father. And therefore, we have a relationship with all three. And the Bible is not the fourth person of the Trinity. There's only three in Father, Son, and Spirit. And the Bible is a book that points us to Father, Son, and Spirit, but it's not them. And we need to understand that if we're going to have a deconstruction of our understanding and therefore have an experience of God face to face, which will unveil unconditional love in that way. Now, most of my understanding about God and Christianity and everything else came from what I was told the Bible said, um, because I was brought up in a very evangelical church um, and churches. Um, and therefore, that was the only way I believe you could understand the Bible. And, and of course, you have a whole load of books written about God, which we call theology books, which are come from studying the Bible and help uh, trying to understand what it says about God. Well, God doesn't want us to study him. God wants us to experience him. And sadly, there are 30,000, some say 40,000 plus denominations all claiming to know what the Bible says. And they all have major differences between what they believe the Bible says. So if 40,000 or 30,000 groups all believe something different, how do we know what we're believing is the truth? Well, I think the only way we're really going to know is if we experience the truth, Jesus as a person. And I believe only face to face experiences with God has revealed the truth to me. And that truth has revealed that God is unconditional love. And that is a real key. Now, I went to Sunday school probably from the age of about two years of age, simply because I was always into mischief as a kid. And my uh, mum sent me with my auntie and uncle to Sunday school as quickly as she could get me to go when I could walk and talk in a way um because it gave her some peace and rest for a, a couple of hours on a sunday afternoon which was when our sunday school was and that was in my local bible christian methodist church and that was the name of the church bible christian methodist church now methodist churches have a lot of different names actually and a lot of different sort of perspectives even in the methodist uh, movement and so in the town where i lived there were six different methodist churches each had a different variant there were primitive methodist churches wesleyan methodist churches and a number of others which were named after the streets or places they were in and they all had slightly different perspectives but they all were basically fairly evangelical in their approach but the bible christian methodist church sort of founded their beliefs on the bible and they were very strong in bible teaching now suffice it to say i was brought up as an evangelical a bible believer who was taught the principles of sola scriptura which means bible alone but i never would have used that term because um, you didn't use terms like that in the methodist church but you were very clearly presented with the fact that the bible alone was what we used in authority in our lives so i was taught that the bible was holy scripture and it was totally inspired by god and as such was inerrant and infallible and then i thought when i was thinking about talking about this was why do we call it the holy bible who says that this book was holy well it's written on the cover so we assume that that must be true who said so we know god is holy and in fact god calls us to be holy but i'm not sure that a book because that book was put together by a group of people who decided what was going to be in the bible in itself we could call holy and I think holy should be left to a description of God, really. Now, I was taught that the Bible was the word of God. And so many times I've used that in the word of God. The word of God says what well, in reality, the Bible never says it's the word of God. 
I was encouraged to read my Bible and pray every day and be a good God botherer. Now, I was with a friend recently and she introduced me to one of her friends and she calls it people who are evangelists, God botherers. Now, I sort of quite smiled when I thought of that. And then afterwards, I thought that's not really such a good term that she thinks Christians are just going to bother her about God because they're going to either uh, trying to convert her or trying to tell her that she's going to go to hell. And I guess some Christians have said that to her, which she then refers to as God botherers because they bother her um, and she doesn't want to be bothered. Now, that's not really a good testimony for somebody who does not yet know the love of God personally to think of other Christians as God botherers. But that really comes from the perspective of what I was taught. We need to preach the gospel to everyone because they're going to hell. And you don't know when someone's going to die. So you do that no matter what. And I know we can be sensitive and we can be relational about sharing the good news with somebody. But being a God botherer was not something that I think we should be called. And we need to ask ourselves the questions. How do people who are not yet believers think about Christians? And do they think of us as Bible bashers who are just trying to get a, another notch on our Bible by having another conversion? How do they think? Do they see us as those who love them unconditionally? Because I believe if they did see that we love them unconditionally, maybe they'd have a completely different view of us in regards to why we want them to know the God that we know. Now, I was taught that the Bible was the only absolute authority for my life. I couldn't trust anybody or anything else. It was the Bible and the Bible alone. Now, I wasn't taught anything about the role of the Holy Spirit in my life. I never, I don't think I ever heard a sermon on the Holy Spirit in the Bible Christian Methodist Church or any other Methodist Church for that matter. Um, and the Holy Spirit was a very peripheral figure in our version of Christianity. Um, it the Holy Spirit wasn't really talked about much other than when people said things about the Father, Son and Spirit. But to be honest, um, I found that the Holy Spirit was completely absent from my understanding. And I remember when I was probably about 16 years of age and I read in the Bible of the, something about the Holy Spirit. I did a, a little word study on the Holy Spirit and I realized I didn't know anything about the Spirit personally, which was such a sad thing when I was brought up to believe in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but I'd never really met the Spirit in that way. Now, as a teenager, I joined the Brethren Church, um, and I was even further programmed into how the Bible should be central to my life and how the role the Bible played in my life. But I was definitely not giving any insight into the Holy Spirit's role because a lot of the whole thing with the Brethren Church was where cessationism came from which was the gifts of the spirit ended with the early church so i didn't really understand anything of the role of the spirit in my life it was only through the bible that god could actually communicate with me or through someone preaching about the bible so i was never taught to expect god to speak to me directly other than through the bible i was never taught that god was love in that way and god as love could directly be experienced and in fact, shows of sort of external emotion were sort of frowned upon. You know, I guess it was OK sometimes for people to sort of have a tear, but to laugh or express those sort of emotions was definitely not on the agenda for most people. Um, and I was never, ever taught that God was my dad. Yes, God was referred to as father, but not my dad. And I think I missed out a lot of understanding and experience through all those years that I was in those churches so i was also programmed by a very specific theological position regarding the future eschatology that looked forward to us being rescued or raptured both the methodist and the brethren eschatology was heavily dispensational premillennial infernalist and cessationist which i now look back and see every one of those doctrines is completely at odds with the truth of what jesus taught and but those influenced my life greatly. And it, it took a big deconstruction process after I actually got baptized in the Holy Spirit, probably in about 1986. 
And in that process, then God spoke to me. And it was the first time I'd ever heard him speak to me directly. And he basically told me I needed to understand the kingdom and covenant. So I went on a three or four year journey where he taught me about kingdom and covenant um, directly. And it was through the Bible that he taught me because he had to use the Bible to deconstruct what I thought the Bible meant. And so a lot of the teaching that I'd received on eschatology, you know, was challenged there, which is why you know, I've written about that in, in my latest book, because I realized that so many people have been uh, deceived by the brethren way of teaching about eschatology and the future. Um, and as God set me free, you know, my desire is to help other people be free also to really understand the nature of God as unconditional love, which means there is no infernal torture for those who don't know Jesus forever. Um, and the gifts of the Holy Spirit have certainly not ceased and are still in operation. Although when we grow into maturity, we don't really need to use the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We actually can function in our spirit in the same dimension, because as we are joined to the Lord in that relationship of intimacy, we become one spirit with him. And that opens up a whole different dimension for it, being able to be creative, as sons of God in a way that I never ever dreamed possible when I was still in those churches many years ago. So I was taught that if you did not accept Jesus as your personal savior, you would be punished and tortured forever in hell with no chance of reprieve. Now that is bad news. That's bad news that the world is rejected. We need to bring some good news. We need to bring good news that the world will accept. And I believe that good news is the nature of God as unconditional love that we can truly experience God in that role uh, and understand what the world really needs is an experience or an awakening to that unconditional love and really experience who God really is. So evangelism was more about fear than love, and it was more focused about avoiding something bad rather than receiving something good, which when I look back, you know, I I'm, feel so saddened really about a lot of the evangelism that I was part of. So how did I ever get to where I am now as one who's really passionate about the unconditional love of God, having experienced it and want everyone else to experience it for all creation and for the restoration of all things? How did I get here? Well, it's a good question. And part of that question is answered in the, the who God made me to be as a forerunner, a visionary, pioneer by nature. Then I, I push through, even if it's difficult. And so my deconstruction process has been quite a, a long journey and challenging journey to be free and deprogrammed from a lot of belief systems that I was programmed by. But I've been willing to push through that because I want to open a door for other people to follow into the freedom of understanding the truth of who God really is and experiencing that unconditional love. So it has been a long journey. And that journey has helped me learn to experience God directly. That journey has had many milestones, including so much deconstruction of my religious program beliefs and the role of the Bible and the Holy Spirit in my life. And that wasn't easy for me because these things are deeply programmed into me from my evangelical upbringing. God is so patient and so kind that this journey has been long and a long winding road of discovery, discovering the truth about who God really is and about the power and reach of his unconditional love, limitless grace, and triumph of mercy. I couldn't have gone from where I was to where I am now in one step. It had to be multiple, multiple steps over many, many years to get me to this place. Now, when someone opens the door and the testimony of deconstruction and coming into unconditional love is shared, then that can speed the process up for people. I, I totally believe that. But yeah, everyone still has to go through having our minds renewed to the truth. And I have no idea how long, long that will take for each individual person, but I know God is committed to it in that he wants us to be free, to know the truth, because the truth you actually know by experience will set you free. And God wants us to live in freedom, not in bondage. So my journey and my testimony of experiencing unconditional love has been a slow deconstruction and a renewal of my mind, more of an evolution rather than a revolution. But that might not always be true of everyone's journey. Sometimes people do have big jumps 
of revelation that just totally change their whole lives and you know i've had some of those experiences um, but when i look at the whole then there's still a small step in the whole journey that i had you know 2008 when i first went into heaven was a radical experience of love when i experienced the fire stones and experience sitting standing on the fire stones and experiencing unconditional love that was a life-changing experience but just one of many that would bring me to the place where i am now only God really knows how to get each of us there. And we need to trust him. Don't try and run ahead of him. Certainly don't lag behind him and keep close to him. Because if you keep walking with him every day, he'll get you where you need to go. And he'll unveil the truth of who you really are. Now, I was taught never to question the Bible or what it taught about God, as that would have been heretical. That would have been how strong that would have been perceived in the churches that I was brought up in. You could not question what the Bible said, but whose version of the Bible and whose version of what it said were you not supposed to question? And that's the thing I've realized. There are so many people who have so many different views that if you can't question any of those views, every, how are you ever really going to learn? Therefore, there were many things that didn't feel right, but studying the Bible mostly only confirmed what I already believe, which is confirmational bias. You know, even though I wanted to know and some things didn't feel right, it wasn't easy for me to study the Bible to find out that it wasn't true or those aspects weren't true because it's so easy that they just get confirmed and you believe what you already already believe. That That's what happened to me many, many times. And it wasn't until I experienced things that that really changed. So I never was taught that the Bible as we know it never existed before AD 385. And that there are many different versions that even had different numbers of books in it. I didn't know that. I just looked at the Protestant Bible that I was familiar with and it had 66 books in it. But the Catholic Bible has 73. The original King James Bible, for example, has 80. And the Ethiopic Bible has 84. So what happened to all those books? And why were they considered to be part of the Bible by some groups and not others? Now, that in itself poses questions about what's in the Bible and whether what's in the Bible is actually what God put in the Bible. or Did men put that in the Bible and all the things that were records of the Old Testament and then records of the books in the New Testament? There was a whole process that they went through. Initially, that was started when Constantine, I think in the 325 Nicene Council, basically asked for all of the writings that had been written and were used to preach in the churches around the whole of the roman empire to be brought to him and then he decided with the bishops what was going to be included and they called it the holy roman bible and all the other things were burnt now so we've no idea what those original documents actually contained or whether there are many other books and writings that god inspired or people wrote to the churches of the day because they have disappeared and we only have some copy of copy of copies left so who knows what might have been or what other truth is out there that could be useful to us well i also believe that each one of us is a book that has a record of what god is doing in our day therefore there should be each of us has a record of our relationship with god and the amazing things that god has done in our lives which is relevant for today and therefore we need to be open for what god is saying for us today not just looking back to what god said four thousand years ago or two thousand years ago to those people of that day so my own process of deconstruction made me aware of just how much i had rationalized and glossed over the huge differences between the god of the old testament and the old covenant and the God seen in the New Testament and the New Covenant. And it, even over the last four or five years, God has continually challenged me over Old Covenant thinking that I didn't think I had, but he challenged me to show me that I did, and therefore challenged that in such a way that he deconstructed my understanding of what I need to think about in regards to the Old and New Covenant. Now, deep down, I knew something was wrong with many things, but my upbringing in Sola Scriptura with the Bible as the sole source of authority for living for the Christian life meant there were many inconsistencies that I wrongly glossed over. 
and never really pursued God about. I might have studied some of them, but I didn't change my study, didn't change my view primarily. So this fear of questioning the Bible actually kept me from asking the hard questions that were subconsciously like splinters in my mind. I knew something wasn't quite right. You know, when you have a splinter in your finger, um, a little piece of wood or something, you can feel it. And sometimes it gets actually quite red and sometimes it gets quite infected if you don't get it out. And there were things that I think were deep in my mind, which actually were causing me problems, but I didn't know how to find the truth. And it was only when my experiences began to challenge my beliefs, that was when the father was really able to seriously renew my mind to the truth. And that happened over a period of time, particularly after I had experiences of face-to-face -face encounters with God in heaven. But the renewal of our mind is absolutely vital and Jesus as the truth is very fundamental to that process. And the spirit of truth is very fundamental to the process because they help us come to a realization of what really is true because it's the truth. And the person of Jesus is the truth. He is the way, the truth and the life. And we need that intimacy of relationship to bring us into that knowledge of the truth, which is beyond intellect. And it wasn't until, therefore, I began meeting the Father face to face that I created such major cr cognitive dissonance that change became inevitable, inevitable. And it was when my experiences challenged my beliefs that caused me to be double minded for a while. What is true is my experience. Is the Bible what I was taught about the Bible, which is true. And I went a little bit wobbly for a while when I first started to go through this process because I didn't know where to put my trust in and of course as I was brought up in those evangelical non-holy spirit believing churches they really frowned on any experience you didn't trust your experiences because your experiences might be wrong but of course the bible's full of people who had experiences that recorded them and there's no inference there that their experiences might be wrong. So why should mine be wrong? Well, that caused me some inevitably problems. But my experiences of unconditional love really accelerated my process of deconstruction, particularly from 2016 onwards, when God really in earnest started to deconstruct my mind and challenge my beliefs about the Bible and the use of the Bible itself in my life. Now, I'll share some of those testimonies. Um, of unconditional love and my encounters with people who had experienced unconditional love and a cloud of witnesses and other things next time. Um, but those experiences challenged my understanding of the Bible as a consistent whole. You know, because let's face it, the Old Testament, what we call, is is sort of a variant of the Hebrew or Jewish Tanakh, which is their Bible. And that was written to a religion which is not ours. Not that we really want to follow religion, but if you know what I mean. So how do we fit that together? Yes, it is a record that you can see God working in the world, but actually, is it applying today? That really means, are we still under the law today? Or are we still under what the old covenant says today? Well, my answer would be no, we're not, because we're under grace. And we have the spirit to guide us, not the letter, because the letter kills, but the spirit brings life. So if you try and keep the law or keep what the Bible says without the power of the spirit enabling you, it will wear you out. So when I then had these experiences, it challenged what I understood as inerrancy and infallibility, which actually the Bible never claims to have, by the way. That's just something that evangelicals have said it has. So what is scripture? What is the word of God? And these are good questions to ask because we can't assume that what we thought or what I was taught were true. Why is it so important? It's so important because if we don't have an understanding of what, how God speaks to us today, then we're going to struggle to hear his voice in any coherent way. Because most Christians are programmed by their understanding of the Bible, and that will vary depending on the different streams that have influenced those beliefs. That's why I use the Bible a lot as the reference point for deconstruction, because that reference point says, this is what you thought this verse meant. 
this is what it could actually mean. And this is what the words actually mean. And I like to go back to looking at what do the original words mean to the original audience so that we understand the relevance it had for them. Then we can put that into perspective for us today. Because when Jesus was talking to those who were still under the old covenant, he wasn't talking to us. So the Gospels of Matthew, Mark and Luke are very different from the Gospel of John. And I believe in the Gospel of John, where the revelation that came to John was through intimacy with Jesus. And the truth was revealed to him that he actually says things that the other writers never put into their version of the life of Jesus. Hence, all of the statements of I am the way, the truth and the life or I am the resurrection of the life. Why are they not presented to in the other three books? Well, because the audience wouldn't have been able to accept them. And he was talking to the disciples who knew who he was and therefore he is talking to us. And that I do believe we can get a lot from reading the, the Gospel of John. And it's my favorite chapter in the whole Bible. And there are, there are pages in my, my Bible that came out because I read them so much in that context, because I knew that God was speaking to me in my day from what he revealed to John. But the others were not under the, the same law that they were under. And Jesus was trying to get them to leave their following of the law and follow him and that was the point of helping them see that what they thought the, the old testament said wasn't the truth unless it was pointing to jesus himself as the messiah which of course they rejected him as so i discovered that the bible has little or nothing to say about itself because it was just a collection of many people's experiences mostly recorded by different scribes hundreds of years after the fact from passed down oral traditions. That's how they recorded it. Therefore, when you look at it from those perspectives, none of those writers knew that it was going to be collected by someone years later and put into a book. They just wrote the things that God inspired or their experiences that they had. Some of them are historical records. Some of them are poetry some of them are different forms, some of them are apocalyptical, some of them are weird, but they wrote what they felt inspired to write. Someone else put them all together and called it a book. Now, 2 Timothy 3.16 is probably the, the Bible verse that most evangelicals would quote to tell you that the Bible is inspired, inerrant, and infallible, but it never uses the word infallible or inerrant and it doesn't actually use the word bible now 2 timothy 3 16 says this all scripture now scripture in most english versions has got a capital s there were no capitals in greek so that capital is put in there by the writers to to get you to infer something that this is something which it actually doesn't say it is which is actually the bible because I was taught that all scripture is referring to the Bible. So the Bible is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, correction, training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. But it doesn't say the Bible because actually the Bible wasn't even written then. So it's capitalized scripture because scripture is a word which has a religious connotation. But actually what the original word was in Greek was graphe, and that word just means writing, and it certainly wasn't capitalized. So this verse does not say that at all. But every time I read it, I was absolutely programmed by my teaching in evangelicalism that this verse was talking about the Bible, and therefore the Bible is inspired by God, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Now, I'm not saying that some of the Bible might not be. I'm not saying all of it is. I think that is for the discernment of the Spirit, who can speak to us through anything, of course. And if anything was inspired, then of course, it is going to be useful for and profitable for teaching, for reproof, and for correction, and for training in righteousness, because it will be inspired by God. And it will effectively be God wanting to use that to help us. But you can't assume this actually is talking about the Bible, which is what I did. So what is scripture? What is the word of God? What is the Bible? 
when was the bible formed does our understanding of the bible help or hinder experiencing god as unconditional love well, that's a really really important question to answer does our understanding of the bible or our previous understanding of the bible help or hinder experiencing god as unconditional love my understanding of the bible hindered me experiencing god as unconditional love because i had a understanding that god was different in the old testament than he was in the new and in the old testament he did some terrible things that i thought he did now i understand that he didn't and in the new testament he seemed pretty good but he had this sort of two-faced double-minded understanding and if god could punish people and torment them forever in the burning fires of somewhere called hell how could i equate that to an unconditionally loving god because that would definitely put conditions on his love like you must be born again and we've obviously looked at the whole concept of born again and realized that born from above which is actually what it really means has already happened for everybody through the power of the resurrection and yet we were taught i was taught that actually that only happens if you pray some prayer or repent or do other things and we've also broken down our understanding of repentance and salvation and realizing that this is what god has already done for us in christ and therefore it's available to everyone just by realization not by works so we've dealt with that but my experience of reading the bible did not help me to understand or experience unconditional love the opposite in fact so the Greek word graphe translated scripture in English in that 2 Timothy 3 16 verse is not referring to our Bible, which did not exist for 300 plus years. It does mean any unspecified previously previous or future inspired writings. Now, that includes some people's inspired writings today. So for me, my writings of my journals, which God spoke to me, is scripture to me. It is inspired writing because God inspired it through our conversations. Now, I wouldn't expect anyone else to treat it that way because God didn't speak it to them. But he did speak it to me and he did converse with me. And I shared that in journals. And therefore, for me, that's inspired writing. Now, every one of us should have inspired writings because God should be speaking to us daily. And if we journal it, those things are inspired to us. They're an inspiration to us and they're useful to train us and equip us and help us come into the full understanding of our identity, who we are and who, who we are as sons of God. So how do you know what's inspired or what isn't inspired? And that's a really important question because I can read something in, let's say, someone's book and I read it and I really feel that is inspired by God. And it feels there's life on it. it. It feels I resonate with it. I resonate with the life of the spirit in it. It is living. It's active. It's powerful to me because it's like God was speaking it to me. And as I resonated with the Holy Spirit and with Jesus as the truth and love, then I felt that was God speaking to me. And therefore, for me, it was inspired. Now, someone else could read that, I guess, and not feel inspired at all by it. But for me, there are things I've read that I feel they're coming directly from God to me. And there are lots of other things that I read that I don't. And there are some things I read in people's books, which I don't resonate with at all, even though in the same book, there are some things I do resonate with. And therefore, I think we should always read with an open heart and an open mind, but with looking for the wisdom and understanding that the spirit can give us to speak to us and to our hearts directly to show us what's inspired the frequency of truth on something for me is what gives me discernment and also does it align to god be in love because that is my plumb line for everything and if i read something that in, infers that god isn't love or he's doing something which is not loving then i'm going to be quite suspicious of whether that is the truth or not so 2 Timothy was written approximately AD 63. The Bible was not canonized until AD 385 or thereabouts. So the writing it was referring to there was not the Bible. And may or may not have included some parts of what we refer to as the Old Testament or the letters written to the churches. We don't know. That is the problem. We don't know. And we're trusting on those who 
jostled and bartered for what was going to be in the Bible in AD 385, I think in the Council of Carthage, to decide what was going to be in there. And from my understanding, there were some things thrown out, which are now included. And there are some things which actually are included, which aren't in the Protestant Bible, which were in the Catholic Bible and other Bibles. So we're in this sort of mixture of like what was actually in it and what was intended to be in it by the people who put it in. And why did they put it in it? Now, what I would contend is that God didn't have anything to do with that. That was man and man had an agenda. And the agenda was they needed something to control people because people were going off in all sorts of weird and wonderful things, they thought. But this gospel spread around the world for the first 350 years, and they had the spirit to rely on in sharing the gospel and bringing that good news message to the world, and the world accepted it, by and large. Therefore, why did they want to change a good thing? Because man wanted to make sure that people were only going to believe what they thought was true. And they didn't trust the Holy Spirit to actually bring that inspiration. And I have a modern day example of that in that I was talking to a friend, an Argentinian guy many years ago, and he was telling me that they did a big campaign in, I think it was in Buenos Aires, um, with a, one of the largest churches in Buenos Aires, which I think was over 100,000 people. And they did big campaign in an area which was hard to reach. And they saw many, many people accept Jesus and come into that relationship. And they were about to run a whole program of discipleship. And God spoke to them and said, don't do it. Don't even contact those people for a year. And they found it so difficult not to. To do, to do that but they did to their credit and they went back a year they didn't give them bibles they didn't tell them anything other than they were experienced god they had encountered god and then they had the holy spirit to help them in the coming year now they went back after a year god gave them permission and they discovered that those people were thriving they hadn't read the bible they hadn't learned how to pray in prayer meetings but their relationship with god through the spirit was inspired and that many of them had amazing encounters of god and his love during that year so we've got to be very careful that we do not try and put our way of doing something onto other people but let's trust that god can disciple people through the spirit without our help and sometimes I think we get in the way of what God wants to do. And I certainly know that I did in some of the things I taught as foundations, which now I would treat with horror of some of the things I taught as foundational things, particularly old covenant foundations in the new. So let's look at 2 Timothy 3.16 of what it actually says. All God breathed or inspired writings are profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Simple. All God-breathed or inspired writings, whichever they are, where they come from, are useful. But that doesn't necessarily mean that every writing is God-breathed or inspired, and every writing that's not God-breathed may not be profitable. So let's be more discerning on what we really think of as something that God has inspired to help us. Now, it might come to a shock as some people that the Bible as we know it is not the scriptures all writings that Jesus or Paul were referring to because it didn't exist. So the Bible is not the word of God. Jesus is the Logos, the living, active word of God. He was with God in the beginning. And he became flesh. Therefore, let's stop calling the Bible the word of God because it isn't. It may contain some words from God and it may contain many words which are not from God, but are from people. Doesn't make them wrong but they're from people and not from God. Therefore, let's make sure that we're discerning whether God is speaking to us directly or not. And some people would read the Bible and have a red letter version of all the things that Jesus said, and they would apply every single thing that Jesus said, no matter who he was talking to, to them today. Now, sometimes he was talking to the Pharisees and Sadducees and the priests. Now, he wasn't very complimentary to them. Now, 
do we really want to accept what Jesus was saying to them and apply it to our lives today? I don't think we would. So there are many divisive arguments over theology and doctrine. They all use the Bible, and that's caused most of the denominations that have formed, all those 30,000 plus, all using the Bible as their proof for what they believe to be right. And so many things are in total contradiction. And there are huge paradoxes in people's understanding and doctrine. Hence, Calvinism and Arminianism, completely opposite ends of the scale. And I know people have tried to bring rationalize and bring them into some sense of well you look forward in this way and then you look back in that way in reality you can't rationalize it because neither one of those doctrines are actually true in fullness now i believe that jesus is the way the truth and the life and the word of god he is the word of god and he said my sheep will hear my voice he did not say my sheep will read my book so Let's stop trying to read a book about God when we can hear God's voice directly, because through the spirit, Jesus, the father are speaking to us all the time. Let's learn to tune in and not have to read and understand a book about God when we can encounter God face to face, heart to heart, mind to mind in the light of his face all the time. So I believe it would be very helpful to have Jesus the truth. And the living word of God take us through a process where he says to us, as he did to his disciples and those who were the audience of his day when he was preaching, you have heard it said, but now I say unto you. In reference to everything we believe with no exceptions. And I, if Jesus would do that for us, let's say everything you now believe about God, about yourself, about everything and you held that up to the scrutiny of Jesus and would ask Jesus to say, you've heard it said, or in other words, you believe this, but now this is what I'm showing you is the truth. I wonder how much we'd have left of what we know is truth if we allowed him to do that. Well, why shouldn't we allow him to do it? Why don't we ask him to do it? Why don't we ask the truth to reveal what is true in our hearts, in our minds? so that we can have a total deconstruction of those things which we now think are true, but actually are not the truth. That would radically change us. And in fact, in 2016, that's basically what God started to do with me. When I was standing with him, I, um, I saw a picture of me. Well, it was, I was standing there, let's say, in this place, in the garden of my heart, where this was a tree and in the tree was a big tapestry and this tapestry was all my experiences with god which when i started looking at it i started to reminisce over thinking that they were all good and then what i saw in the middle of the tapestry was a thread tiny little bit of thread sticking out now as a child i just could not resist pulling threads yeah if i had a jumper with a thing my mum would say do not pull threads but i just couldn't help it i had to and when i pulled this thread in this picture the whole tapestry unraveled and ended up as a whole pile of yarn on the floor and jesus or i think it was the father was standing behind it and he then said to me how much of what you know about me has come through what other people have said or what you studied yourself and how much has come directly from me. And what he was trying to show me is don't frame everything, even you've experienced in your own understanding, because that was the beginning in earnest of my deconstruction. Because my understanding, even about my experiences with God in heaven face to face, were not necessarily the truth. And he wanted to show me that I cannot lean to my own understanding, even of my experiences, and expect those things to be full understanding, because my understanding is not going to cut it. I need the revelation of the truth of Jesus to actually really say to me that this is what I'm saying about what you've just experienced. Because how many people have experiences and completely misconstrue what the experience means how many people have had prophecies 
and have given prophecies and then totally misinterpreted the prophecy because they interpret it through their own understanding. It's like there are many prophecies which are true, and yet the interpretation of the prophets are not necessarily true. We need to have discernment through Jesus, the truth, to help us. So let's be open. Let's be really open to deconstruction. Let's be really open to allow Jesus to open our hearts and our minds to know what is the truth. And I, I love this uh, passage in Luke 24, 27, when Jesus was walking with the disciples and he was hidden from them. And it says, then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. They said to one another, were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road, while he was explaining the scriptures to us? Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. So wouldn't it be wonderful if Jesus could do that for us today to open our minds to what is scripture and what isn't scripture and to what it actually means rather than what we think it means. Then we would have a fuller understanding of that God is the same God in the old covenant as he is in the new. Jesus is the express image of God and came to express that God is love rather than the angry God who needs appeasing that we're afraid of when we read the Old Testament because he unveiled to them the truth. And I, I haven't actually gone back and listened to that conversation. Perhaps it's one of the things I ought to put on my list to go and do, go back and listen to what he said. Because I believe that what I think he might have said is probably not really what he did say. And we might be very surprised if we fully understood what he said. Now, who were those two people? Well, we, we know we know who they were, but where did they write their books? Did he give them permission to write a book about what he shared? Did they pass that on to any of the other disciples? We have no record of them doing so. So maybe what he said was just for them. And maybe what he'll say to us is just for us. But I think we need to have our hearts open for that. Now, there are, there are some passages in the old, what we call the Old Testament, which I do not necessarily believe are translated correctly from the original language. And I also believe that some of the things written there are written from the perspective of the writers and are not necessarily inspired. And why do I say that? Well, Jeremiah 8, 8 says this, how can you say we are wise and the law of the Lord is with us? and we are learned in its language and teachings. Behold, the truth is that the lying pen of the scribes has made the law into a lie, a mere code of ceremonial observances. So those who actually transcribed some of the, what we know to be the Old Testament, actually were transcribing lies. So which bits do they transcribe as lies? And which bits are transcribed as truth? I don't know. But I think the Holy Spirit can help us. And when we come to understand who God is in the Old Testament, we need that discernment. Without that discernment, we may find we don't really discover the reality of who God is. And God has never changed. He is unchanging. He is totally 100% unchanging. And therefore, you, what we are reading about God in that book, I don't believe is the truth as we've understood it. And I think anything which contradicts God being love, we have to hold up to the scrutiny of the spirit and ask the spirit for the revelation. I found this little quote. It says, don't visit the Old Testament without your Jesus passport. You're not a Jew living under the old covenant before the Messiah came. Hence, you have no business visiting and spending time in the Old Testament, the world of Moses, without taking Jesus with you or the spirit of truth. The Old Testament becomes beautiful to us when we see it through the eyes of the Spirit, not through the letter of the law, 2 Corinthians 3. And that whole passage in 2 Corinthians 3 is quite an interesting passage, and I think it's one worthy of scrutiny. Jesus is the only truth and living word we can rely on. The Bible is at best in English a book that points us to Jesus. We need to develop our relationship with Jesus directly, not through trying to study Jesus in the Bible. Because if you try and do that, you're going to run into confirmation bias. 
In fact, Jesus said himself, John 5, 39, you search the scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me. You are unwilling to come to me so you may have life. So what Jesus was saying there, you're not going to get life through the scriptures. You're going to find life in me. And those scriptures point to me. Don't get stuck in the pointer and miss what it's pointing to is the message here. And they thought, and I think evangelicals think, that they're going to get eternal life through the scriptures. And in reality, the eternal life is going to come through Jesus. So what scriptures did Jesus open his disciples' minds to? What specifically did he reveal to them? Because I think what he revealed to them would be very challenging, I think, to many evangelicals today. So... 2 Corinthians 3.3 3 says this, being manifested that you are a letter of Christ, cared for by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on the tablets of human hearts. Such confidence we have through Christ towards God, not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God, who also made us adequate as the servants of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit for the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. And we must be so, so careful that we're not operating in a dead letter that brings death rather than the living spirit that brings life. And some of the teaching that I received was definitely a dead letter that killed. It brought me no life. In fact, it put me under bondage. Therefore, we've got to be so careful that we receive from the spirit of life and don't get stuck in that old covenant understanding of law. Jesus summed up all of the law and the prophets in himself and made the focus of everything one simple thing, love. You've heard it said, but I say unto you. And everything he said was based in love, love, love. And therefore, when Jesus in John 13, 34 says, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. He was summing up everything that was leading up to him and that he was a revelation of love. And all that means is let him love you so you can love others. You cannot love others out of law, duty or obligation. You will never, never have enough strength to do it. But if you receive love from him, you will be inspired to love in like matter, manner. And therefore, John 15, 12 says, this is my commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. He emphasizes that in another verse. So literally, you are a living epistle by receiving freely and therefore releasing unconditional love. You are a living letter. You're a living letter to the cosmos. You're a living letter to creation. But it does that letter reflect unconditional love? Have you received unconditional love and are you releasing unconditional love or is it just conditional? Is it religiously conditional or is it free? Are you a living love letter to the cosmos? Is the cosmos looking at you and seeing unconditional love? Because Jesus also said in John 13, 35, by this, all men will know you're my disciples if you have love for one another. So are we living loved? Are we loving living? Are we living loving? Are we an expression of unconditional love to the world in which we live? Are we expression of unconditional love to the family in which we live in, to the workplace that we may work in, to our friends, to our neighbors? Are we demonstrations of unconditional love? Because if we are, those people are going to be drawn to Jesus. If we're not, those people are probably going to be pushed away from Jesus. So it's absolutely vital that we become that living love letter to the world in which we live. And it's down to us. This is the mandate of sonship, that we'll be fruitful. And we'll multiply and we'll increase and we'll fill the earth and we'll subdue and we'll rule. Establishing the kingdom of God in heaven as it is on earth. That is the key. That is what I believe is everything is about 
is us experiencing this unconditional love, that transforming our lives, bringing us into the freedom of what unconditional love really is, and therefore releasing that to the world. The world needs to be awakened by unconditional love. The world needs unconditional love to come into the reality of who God is. And in that experience of God, finding their identity, finding the truth of who they are. And I believe it's so, so important in the days in which we live, in which there's so much trouble, so much uncertainty, so much double-mindedness, so many people are insecure, so many people are looking for answers, so many people are looking for love. Are they looking in the right place? Are they going to find that reality? So the question is, have you experienced unconditional love yourself? Are you living in unconditional love yourself? Are you demonstrating unconditional love yourself? Do you have a vision, a heavenly vision of unconditional love, which is your life message? Because that was Paul's life message. That which he received on the Damascus Road, a heavenly vision that revealed God's unconditional love to him, even while he was murdering followers of Jesus, killing them, God loved him unconditionally and awakened him to that love and gave him a mission to go and preach that unconditional love that God was in the Gentiles and that God had already loved them and wanted them to know his love and to know him if you've got that heavenly vision that will inspire your whole life so i believe we're all on a journey towards that we're all on a journey to discover that will take us beyond every barrier every restriction every limitation to limitlessness to the limitlessness of unconditional love to the limitlessness of grace to the limitlessness of triumph and mercy so that we can actively participate in the restoration of all things. All people, all created things and beings, creation itself is longing for the revealing of the sons of God. And what is the very essence of the sons of God? Those who have experienced unconditional love and therefore those who are demonstrating unconditional love. So I would encourage you just to open up your hearts, open up your minds, allow the Holy Spirit to take you on this process of deconstruction, putting the Bible in the right reference point to your life, engaging the living word of God, Jesus, so that you can come to the truth. And the truth that you know by experience will set you free and you will have a testimony that will enable other people to be set free as well. So let's just uh, take a few minutes just to engage with God, with unconditional love. Let's just take that place where we can just learn to enter into that place and experience that. I just encourage you, just close your eyes. Just begin to still your hearts and still your minds. I'm just going to release a few frequencies and just release those frequencies so that you can engage in the reality of unconditional love yourself. So I'm just going to just, just some sounds and just focus your thinking and your intention on the sound, the sound of unconditional love, the frequency of unconditional love. Just start to slow down your breathing. Focus your thinking on God. Focus your thinking on engaging unconditional love. Just breathe in deeply. And as you breathe in, you're breathing in the unconditional love of the Father for you as his child just feel that unconditional love flow through you just feel the vibrational frequency of unconditional love let it flow wait in that place be still just be still and let god love on you just be still and let the love of god that unconditionally love rest on you 
that he reveals himself to you as unconditional love. Just perhaps maybe you want to ask Jesus as the truth to speak to you something specific right now. You have heard it said, but I say unto you, just open up your hearts, open up your minds. Maybe some belief system, maybe the way you've looked at God, maybe the way you have been programmed with religious thinking, some mindset or belief system. Just open up your heart and you ask Jesus as the truth, the living, active word of God to show you something where he is saying, you've heard it said, you believe this, but I'm saying unto you this. Just spend a few moments listening, opening up your heart, listen to his voice, revealing something to you that will bring freedom to you at this moment, that will bring truth to you at this moment. Just let that frequency of his voice engage you. You might want to just be proactive and ask the Father to begin that process of deconstruction. That you would have your own picture of all the things you believed and understood as a tapestry in front of you that would unravel as the truth reveals those things that we've leaned our understanding towards. Just ask the Father to begin or continue that process of deconstruction, renewal of your mind, bringing you into agreement with the mind of God, that we are one with the mind of Christ, in agreement, agreeing with his mind about you. I believe that the Father wants to speak to you directly right now and tell you just one thing, of the vast sum of his thoughts about you, which will change your thinking. Just open up your hearts, open up your mind and hear him speak that one of those amazing thoughts he has about you that will just totally transform your thinking on that one thing. Just open up your hearts, just listen to him as he speaks words of encouragement and kindness to bring you into the freedom of the truth. Just feel the unconditional love of God for you as his child flow through your whole being, flowing through you, in you, around you. You live in an atmosphere of unconditional love, in an atmosphere of freedom, of love, of joy, of peace, of rest. You're cocooned in unconditional love in a safe place to explore, a safe place for revelation to flow. Heaven is open. Set your desire upon engaging the Father's heart. 
you can engage in the realm of light you can engage anywhere he wants to take you but he'll take you deeper into that place of love show you experiences encounters with unconditional love revealing truth at a deeper level so that you can live loved free from guilt shame condemnation from your past that you can live loving releasing mercy just as you have been forgiven you release forgiveness to all around you that you love living that you enjoy life to the full so you can rest in love in joy in peace and truly experience the reality of who you really are as a son of god as one creation is looking to as a living letter of unconditional love 